You ever encountered that person who said, I can't change or I don't have to change or you can't change me or stop trying to change me. Or maybe even you've been in a relationship where you realized if something doesn't change here, this is done. Welcome to Leading Leaders Podcast. Five minute videos, five days a week. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast, and change is a hard thing. In fact, I believe it's John Maxwell, and he may not have been the first who said, but he said, change usually only happens when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain required to change. Now, we've seen it across the board in organizations of all sizes. It doesn't matter if you're talking about just a couple's relationship or a family or a small group like a community or a church or a, an entire city with a crime problem or a political structure or a nation or somewhere in between with an entrepreneurial business or a corporation, change is hard. Change is an arduous process. Sometimes changing out equipment can cause you to lose certain people. You realize with this piece of technology, I can replace six people. Well, that's going to cost you money in the equipment, but it's going to save you money in salaries and pensions and retirement and health benefits. So that's a good change, right? But then what happens when you lose those people? See, one of the challenges that we have is sometimes change comes into an organization and we see this change as a, a delightful necessity. And then at the same time, we realize this is going to be a painful process. In fact, there was a book, I, I have it over there, I have several copies of it, in fact, called Who Moved My Cheese? And it was about around the dot-com boom phase that there were a lot of people whose lives were changing. The, the whole world was changing. The way that we did business was reinvented yet again. And as those changes took place, those changes cost people jobs, cost them careers, and people who had long-term careers in a specific type of an industry just went poof. And then there were new opportunities and there were new jobs and there were overnight millionaires who were 22 and 23 years old because they understood the digital age. They just didn't understand how to save or spend money or, or how to reinvest that money. And some of them, like Mark Cuban, became world financiers and others blew through a couple million dollars in a couple of months and that was the end of their fame. But change happens. The question is, how do we orchestrate that change in such a way that A, it changes the progress and the direction that we want it to go, uh, like we might build jetties or dams to control the flow of a river? How, how do we maximize the way of change? All right, the next question will be, how do we make that painless or as painless as possible? And the third would be, how do we make it permanent? How do we make it possible painless and permanent. Now, I'm not going to promise to answer all three of those questions in one fail swoop. In fact, what I'm going to tell you today is just a revelation that I've come to in the last few hours, although I've kind of been pounding around it for, I don't know, probably 15, 16 years. The reality is culture. But that, that sounds really weird. I mean, a lot of people have talked about the culture of your workplace, the culture of your family, the culture of your environment, the culture of your society or your nonprofit organization. Uh, and the answer is, yeah, that, that's all it takes for change is culture. But let me go a little bit deeper and explain what I've discovered, rediscovered, learned in a new way, come to the revelation of in the last probably 96 hours. There's a couple of TEDx talks out there. One of them, uh, the guy uniquely takes a tuning fork, two tuning forks, tuned to the same A, and he mounts them and he smacks one of them several times until it begins to resonate at its harmonic frequency that it's created for. And then as it begins to resonate, he grabs it and forces it to stop resonating. But the other tuning fork is tuned to the exact same frequency. And the result is this harmonic frequency, this vibration, hold on to that word, this vibration coming from one tuning fork now begins to resonate in the other tuning fork. And even though he stopped the first tuning fork, the vibration continues in the second tuning fork. Now he goes on in his TED talk to talk about how we've discovered that there are certain frequencies to pretty much everything in life, whether you're talking about 
bringing down a bridge, which I've talked about on this show before, or breaking a glass, which I've talked about on this show before, how the verbal or vocal frequencies, the frequency of the wind, the frequency of footsteps can destroy a structure as fragile as a wine glass or as enormous as a steel and concrete bridge. And so he uses that illustration to say, we've discovered that certain cancer cells like leukemia have a very specific frequency. And that if we can use harmonic resonance, we can destroy cancer cells with frequencies. Hang on to that for a minute because that resonance is so powerful. Now let me skip forward to some learning that I just received from Moran Cerf. He's a PhD neuroscientist, screenwriter. He does a lot of storytelling like I do, which is a good resonance for me, but he's also a business major. He teaches at the Kellogg School of Business. He's a pretty brilliant guy. And he talked about a specific study where they were able to cause people in the same proximity to each other in a conversation or in the same room. If you watch their brains with all of the electronic devices we have, that you can actually see their brains light up the same way when they start talking together, when they're in proximity to each other. In fact, you could take person A and person B and move them to entirely different environments and their brain waves that they resonated together with would then become resonant to the other people around them. Now, obviously, you could take anybody else in the room that's not paying any attention to them and their brain waves are going to be completely different. But the two who are in conversation, the two who are in proximity, the two who are in relationship begin to create their own harmonic resonances between two different brains. Now, what does that say about a work environment, a family environment, a relationship environment? What it says is when you're thinking on the same wavelength, there's a synergistic and reciprocal and exponential reaction to that. When two people are not on the same wavelength, when they're not thinking the same, it's called dissonance and not resonance. And that dissonance causes challenges and problems. That's where arduous change comes from. When there's resonance, when the culture around says, I want your ideas, I wanna give you my ideas, when there's a free flow of ideas and an exchange of ideas, there's an entirely different environment, an entirely different culture, and change is significantly more possible. But see, that goes back to communication, it goes back to relationships, and it goes back to my favorite, storytelling. How do you tell the stories, both internally and externally, that allow you to resonate with people around you? That's pretty powerful stuff. If resonance can bring down a bridge, if resonance can break a wine glass, if resonance could kill leukemia, what would resonance, just the ability to relate until you're on the same vibrational wavelength with the people around you, what would that do to your finances? What would that do to your marriage? What would that do to your relationship with your kids or your customers or your coworkers or your boss? See, taking the time to get on the same wavelength with other people, it may require a little bit of discipline on your part. It may cause you to emote a little differently. It may cause you to be a little more of an empath than a director or a tyrant. And that's going to take some effort on your part. But once you've done that, change is a whole lot easier in culture than it is being forced on people. And the opportunity to change and to grow, it's a powerful thing. Leaders look for that opportunity to resonate with the people on their team. It's part of that whole process of understanding what makes them tick, understanding what they're compassionate about, what their passions are that drive them, what it is they want in life. Oh, you can bring about change in your life and in the life of other people, but first you have to resonate. And some might just call that building rapport. But it is really the responsibility of the leader to help create the culture where people can get on the same wavelength. Now, this isn't just relational stuff on the outside surface. This is now being proven through brain science, through neuroscience, through the studies of the electronical paths in the brain and the frequencies that can bring down a bridge or bring down cancer. Take some time to think about those things today and ask yourself the question, am I creating a culture where people resonate with each other in a harmonious way? Or am I creating friction by the way that I lead? 
I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom.